I'm going to do a, this is where I sit at the beginning of the day, usually this is where you see me with my little uh, Bible's not there today because we wanted a bug to enjoy a nice place to take a nap, see? So the Bible is not important enough to me. I can't give it to the smallest creature on earth. It's a place to take a, sh a shit or just take a little breath of fresh air. And Christians should be thankful that you know, part of nature chose their book as a place to lay down, right? And that keeps all your articles of faith because they're so respectful to the earth and other living beings. Wait, what is a shitty book like that compared to a place with a tiny insect to take a shit? You know, and exercise a kind of freedom that, in a sense, many Christians don't think any of us deserve to have. I've had white Christians tell me not to take a shit in my own bathroom. It's amazing throughout the course of my life um, what I've been able to somehow accidentally tease out of white people about what's on their mind, about what I should and should not feel safe doing. It's incredible. It's really something. One day I'm going to write an entire little booklet on it and list, bullet point, what white people have said to me. That's okay because you're white and you're, if I may say, over-Christianized. It's amazing that no white people have ever looked up a honeymoon and what it means. It's part of a language of a lunar death cult, which is the language of the English language and the language of Christianity. It's a lunar death cult, right? It takes the horizon of life, death, and the brainstem and puts it in the death direction for your own good. And it's a prerogative that given the many imminent dangers to and threats to our system, existentially and biologically, it basically receives a resounding assent and acclamation by every subject of it, right? So to criticize it is not such a bad or awful or dangerous thing to do. It's almost beyond criticism as it is. So I'm like a, a little nerd in the basement of a university that won't hire me. It's, that's it. That's all I am. I'm aware. I'm not delusional of my own insignificance. So you don't have to remind me, right? But I, I'm not about significance. I'm about how things signify to me and how I can practice signifying to the space and the air around me. It's worthy of the air I breathe. Being thankful for how nature and time continually offer up nourishment and love to the human mind and to all creation. Because in my religion, that's what it does, and that's what I'm thankful for. Nor do I walk around with a, a halo on my face, proclaiming my love and kindness and peace and equanimity to all things, because that wouldn't be realistic. It comes and goes like anything else. Nice times of year, happy rain. Not so happy, different feelings altogether. <laughs> okay? And we try to keep track. <laughs> so, you know. I, uh, I have to live with me. I have no interest in being delusional, or at least too delusional, because that would go against my own better interests, you see. And people don't let me. So, white people don't let you exercise your religion too far. So I get lots of signs being posted up in boundaries saying, hey, we don't like you, I don't really get a good feeling about you, and you stink. I've had that since I was a child. From <laughs> some of my own relatives, so, you know, I don't smell good. I've got the smell of an English bum to me. <laughs> the smell of nature, which, you know, the only time women seem to like it is when it makes them horny, so, you know, mm, you smell like trees in the ocean. Can I do you? <laughs> Let me stare at your ass until my heart weeps. <laughs> it's like, hmm. Yeah, it's funny. Like, even my asshole can be attractive to fat, angry white women. It's amazing what pain and disturbances of the mind will do to make anyone attractive. You know? What do you think she's honing in on with my ass? Like, does she want to do me? Is she imagining how often and swell I could pump her for information? Right. How I could turn her vagina into a yogurt dispenser. <laughs> you know? It's like, woo -wee. You know, it's like, mm, you know, each one to their personal fantasies, I say. <laughs> keep it, keep it in the private place. That's why they're called private parts. You say, oh, that's stupid. Why they call, you know, um, Sarah Kay said, why they call private parts? He's a spoken word poet, lovely woman. And it always made me think, like, you know, I think that's a little white effete thing. Like, why are they called private? <laughs> it's like, well, it's because what you do with them usually has to be done in private. Like, in advance of, like, the kinds of things you might want to do with your parts. You know, like, pay, play Mario and Luigi one day, you know. And I think that's why they're private. But also, yes, in a sense, like, private property. Because it's owned by the government. <laughs> so, yeah, that's another way it's called private. And think of the word pri, not just privatization, but privation. What is privation? It's something that is starved. 
right? And what do people do with their organs when they're stored for nourishment from their mother and nature and time? When you say, hey, the sun just feels loving, and they're like, it's just photons, shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know, so, uh, and then after years and years, I just thought, well, it's got vitamins, it's nourishing, ergo, it is food. <laughs> ergo, it is love. Ergo, I feel like an ego waffle. Uh. So I think when I say that, I think white people are sick and psychopathic. I also would say that they're, I can also say that I can understand why. Why I can scarcely isolate myself from their problems because I'm clearly sickened by them, or so I say. And I could also say that, well, so is everyone else. That not everyone feels sick. And not everyone will agree whether they are sick uh, with at least not what I say they're sick with, whether they feel it or not. That's absolutely true. You know? So whatever your category you want to put it in, opinion and healing and just subjective self-help, you know, it's fine. You can relax, sit back, you know, have a cup of coffee and just enjoy. And if something piques your interest, go, ah, all right. You might even say, like, I don't know about this guy, but I'm willing to listen for a little bit. You know, like talking to a weirdo at the coffee shop, except you never have to see me again. <laughs> so, and that's why I'm able for me to talk as much as I do, because I'm not forcing someone to listen to me. Otherwise, I would never make a peep, and people like us almost never say anything to anyone. <laughs> and just think about what those people might know. <laughs> you know, they're forced to be good listeners. <laughs> Everywhere, except in their own mind. When a white person, like a nice family, the female says to me that your thoughts are just a monkey mind, I just think, what have you been reading? Like, I mean, there's so many different ways you could take that, only one of which is, hey, what a stupid mind you have. You need to get that under proper control by appropriate spiritual instruction. That's one way of looking at it. Oh. It's just so rhetorical, you know, and I don't think people realize that spiritual terms and jargon are so aggressive, really. They, because they want something from us, and they claim something from people, and people get something in return for giving it away, and it doesn't always feel good to other people. You know, I don't want to give away my thought to the phrase monkey mind. I'm sorry. And I'm sure there are all kinds of poignant reasons why someone would say that. But, you know, in a sense, it's like your private parts. Keep it to yourself. Any sociopath can say that the ego is a, is a problem. And you can say, but I like my ego, it's my sense of self, and then they'll change the subject. Because any sociopath or sick white person can use spiritual jargon because they're allowed to want what they want while they're making free to talk with another person over whom they don't have any control or indulge them with all sorts of things that are constantly forming and never form well enough without needing a kind of surrogacy out of the person they happen to be objectifying at the moment. <laughs> Lots of fancy words there. Lots of fancy words. He's got those fancy words. Fancy, fancy, I say. I think I'm becoming a little more gay. I had my first gay dream this week, but I've also been depressed. Depressed by dreams. I'm not depressed by the day. I'm just depressed, depressed when I'm sleeping. So it's kind of finding its way out. And, uh, I was lost. I was looking for someone or my mom and her dog in some wilderness where my family was spread out. And I was like, I, I knew that she was going to get lost because we didn't keep track of each other. And how a heinous thing. I just, I woke up just feeling dog tired looking around for my mother in some kind of trail system I didn't know very well. You know? And uh, well, I think, you know, depressing your dreams. For sure. Mom was telling me another place that she happened to get lost um, one day. Where was it? Um, let's see how good a listener I am. We were watching TV at the time. But, <clears throat> oh, we saw a guy today at the coffee shop, and I said, He looks like Severide, which is a very attractive man or a fireman on TV on Chicago Fire. And, and I said, and she said, Yeah, my mom doesn't often agree with me. So I was like, Oh, yeah, yeah. That's an attractive man. Looks well like him. So I've, I've definitely gotten gayed up a little bit <laughs> watching Firefly with my mom. <laughs> you know, I'm able to see men as attractive now. It's like, oh yes, that is. I don't want to have sex with them, but it's like they're definitely attractive for all the right reasons. They seem like a nice person. And, you, know, you know, they're attractive to look at, but you know, who better to uh, comment on the character of another attractive man but a straight male? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You know, he has to prove himself to me. I'm not just going to have a gay romance 
with the video on TV, guys. Um, oh, I have standards. Well, I'm just going to see these fictional alpha males, you know, and how they are. And everyone's impressed by them because they have skill and energy. It's just energy that especially white society needs to get their point across to people being malignant of the way. And uh, so there is something, even in the protagonists of such shows, of the ability to accuse other people and conduct, even done in, in you know, okay terms, forgivable terms on TV, your own private investigation of the character of other people. And... Uh, and treat them in ways you wouldn't normally treat someone with an adept amount of physical energy that could be perfectly masked as though they were born um, completely normal behavior. And the other person is supposed to understand. Nice. You know, I'm going to treat you like shit. Give me a little smoke signal, make energy out of a black hole to let me know that I'm sniffing up the wrong tree. I mean, if you don't have a little flare to fire up the file, file you're left in a great suspension as to your safety moving on with any number of social places and people. Has that ever happened to you? It happens to me all the time whenever I'm around white people. <laughs> you know, it's just always brewing. At a coffee shop, it's brewing. It should be called not coffee brewing, menace growing. Menace brewing. Coffee house. Because it's a place where white people go to kind of almost commit crimes and talk about the crimes they almost want to commit against basic social boundaries. So I think that white people have been over-Christianized you know, in a way that I think Christianity makes sense in the heroic structure of daytime and evening television. It does. I don't see why a Christian should object to modern entertainment and heroic mythology, which is also kind of a Jewish death cult. It's not wrong. I think it's just a, something we've absorbed that uh, maybe in a future age will be a solar death cult or will just be a solar life cult or a lunar life cult or, you know, there's options, <laughs> you know, we should do a, a referendum. <laughs> do you want to remain with the lunar Christian death cult or would you like one of these three or four other alternatives? <laughs> and are you willing to pay for it? <laughs> you know, but this time we'll try other places than the tailpipe. <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> what do you think people would vote for? <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, but within all these boundaries, all these things that I don't like about, right, that's where we find our religion. Maybe part of my religion, just like everyone else's, is to eke out my little place in a world that I think is too evil for my liking. You know, that's fine too. I bet you not everyone does that. So, or thinks they do. But I like, I'm like a cat. I want to go curl up and hiss at the world and go watch my Netflix. That's what I will do today. That's basically what we're doing now. <laughs> like a cat, really. I watched a white man going, you know, in a very treacherous territory with an approaching lion or two. And I thought, how can people do that? People saying, oh, they've got balls. And it's like, well, they're choosing and they know what they're doing. And they, but it's like, yeah. But thankfully, though, I mean, really, this says something good about white people's psychology, is that everyone knows that they would never want to do this. So they are learning respect, you know? Even if someone does it well, it doesn't mean that I'm going to go, you know, hang out with an octopus. So I think, I think people do tend to get that. The extraordinary nature of it is it, included information about how truly dangerous it is, because in the heroic sense, you're watching it because it is dangerous, and you like it because it is dangerous, and they're doing it anyway. And you don't ever imagine for a second that you could do it. But it's nice to see someone else doing it in a way that you can understand. And you can get a blessing out of that. Like, look at what we have done as a race. We can hang out with the bears. And we can roam with the wolves. And we can sleep with a tiger. You know, it's like, look what we've done, everyone. <laughs> someone from another planet goes, what can you do as a race? Well, we can hang out with animals that are designed to kill us and get away with it. Mm, pretty good. Can you try now? No, no, I mean, like, our race can do it. I can do it. You need to find that guy. Okay. So they go find him. <laughs> Rain told us that you'd be happy to perform an experiment for us. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, oh, who's Rain? <laughs> Just a guy. He's one of your race. He said he knows you. <laughs> okay. Um, I will, when I get back, I'll talk about the English language, and a strange figure of speech that I heard on television watching with my mom. And we had a quick little discussion about it, you know, and uh, a little bit of media and Christianity and English figures of speech, okay? And male and, and male dynamics. So we'll get back, we'll do that.
Bible's still here. Good. And I'll just say this. I did leave it knowing that it wasn't going to rain last night, so there's a little bit of respect for my own belongings, which is kind of what it is now. Well, we made it to the Eagles uh, Stone Hall. It's not the most interesting story plot, but it's easy. And uh, a fireman is running for the head of his union, kind of political office. He's very passionate about the subject, but he doesn't know how to do public speaking. So another fireman sits him down and says, I've created uh, some cards, some topic cards, because I know what you talk about, how passionate you are. And he's looked at them in a pretty good order that he often talks about various related subjects, which makes sense because he cares and he's a fireman. And uh, he starts talking, he gets to his points. Um, do this, shouldn't do this, saves money, better for everyone, less benefits, blah, blah, blah. And it makes sense. And, got the studies and you shouldn't be doing this to save money and the guy says great you're doing a good job helps him out he's very supportive but gives him 
pretty good heads up of what kind of audience you're talking to and you know how to approach things all this kind of stuff well and then when they're done and he's set and he's confident we're ready to do the show he says to him okay you'll be the brawn and i'll be the brains and they're like right on and i said mom stop that for a second it's like that other guy has a lot of brains too he's the one running he's just shy about he's got like all this knowledge and this guy's got a good head too because he's listened to it so you know they're both playing really good roles and they both have really good brains and they're really doing a good job you know why does only one person get brains you know and then that's where the characters would say it's just a figure of speech but it's very divided and it's very um unfair um it's very stingy to give its praise isn't it it's divided and now less than it was while it is actually an unfair characterization of what they've accomplished right in terms of what they have to offer and uh they're really being good friends, good buddies. And I was saying on TV, like, really, you don't want to be called buddy most of the time. At best, you're just some random person, and they're asking you something to, to solve a crime. Like, hey, buddy. But usually, like, buddy in the white world is not your friend, right? It's, it's not, like, you know, it's not, when people say, when white people say buddy to me, it's not a good thing. Right? I don't feel like they're buddy. But, you know, it's very passive aggressive, you know. But if you don't feel like my buddy because I called you a buddy, that's your problem. Hey, hey buddy. <laughs> you know, it doesn't telegraph good things, you know. I would never use it. And if I do, I suppose, I mean, you'll see, maybe it's, it doesn't have a lot of good usage. It doesn't mean good things. Good things are coming, you know? I do believe we have food in here. Get some protein in here. Okay. I think that's pretty much the last day for me today. So that'll be fun. Uh, tomorrow maybe. It's it's a good day. And there's a blue heron. I started the day with a blue heron, which is nice. They're, they're really they're really a nice part of you know any creature. The great thing about any creature is coming something you like or around you is that it draws the whole landscape into a higher order of potential meaning. Well, that's probably like a painting. It could be a fox or a tree or the wood smoke of a cowboy or something that just draws your attention to all of the wonderful, relevant, meaningful potentiality in the landscape because it is a place where we can gather meaning and a place that offers us in real time a tremendous amount of nourishment that isn't always immediately visible to the eye. As much as the eyes teach, there is a food in nature that the eye, kind of like a mother's breast, it needs to have its hunger peaked, you know, to feed on certain levels of, of what's available in nature. Comprehended by, I mean, perhaps an aesthetic arrest. Or an epiphany. There's an epiphany in the artist's words that the artist may just have some faith that somebody will pick up on it, that they or she or don't know what, more or less it will be to that person, only that it has a kind of productive quality. But artists don't say, I'm sharing the spirit of the Lord with you, and those of you who feel that spirit will know how beautiful my art is, you know, and you will be convinced that God is on high. there is still a current to it, a faithfulness to some wonderful, higher, lower, perfect, ineffable order to existence that allows humans to share moments of great beauty through art or anything. I'm definitely a Christopher Hitchens kind of guy. 
I'm not really as much of an atheist as he is, but he's a damn fine atheist, I'll say that. I have no trouble with atheists. None whatsoever. I don't mind if someone doesn't believe what I believe. That doesn't bother me. I bother when someone, you know, is, is too rhetorical with not enough, you know, panache. I have trouble with Christians being Christians. And sometimes they just, like, and I realize it works for their audience, maybe, but it doesn't work for me. I'd like to see something more. If someone could point out a Christian, not Jordan Peterson, who has got some sort of power erudition that I should not possibly want to miss, then please let me know. Um, I liked uh, one guy. Um, he was a Christian theologian. He was debate, he was debate people. I forget his name. He was a doctor. White dude, nice, good-looking guy. And I forget his name. He's a fine guy. He always just was respectful and made good arguments. <coughs> I think he debated Sam Harris at one point. I'm sure he was nice. Richard Dawkins, in a way, even though he's an atheist, is kind of a good Christian. I mean, you, you could see he probably went to a Catholic school or something. There's a dedication. I mean, Catholicism is a great version of Christianity because it's actually more studious than the average American Christian church where, you know, from the Quakers on up, I mean, if you just, you know, say a few words of the Bible and do what everyone does on Sunday, you're pretty much there, right? As to, like, deepening your knowledge of the universe, using God or the Bible or anything else as a, as a tool and a guide. And it doesn't mean that you're departing from the, the, the righteous and faithful that belong properly to God. You're using your mind for what God gave you. I mean, what better thing to use your mind to study and question the Bible? You would think that God would be very happy about that. And not, ooh, you're too smart for your own good. You're, you're catching on to my little scheme. <laughs> you know? um, because it is a scheme, in a way. And God tells you that Jesus is not really his son. And you shouldn't really believe what he's saying, in a way. Just like McDonald's is kind of saying, you know, our food really isn't that healthy. It, it's The truth is always in there somehow. It's a lunar death cult. And God kind of tells you, hey, you have to pick. This is kind of a rat race. If you believe it, that's your choice. Because the best way to take in God and religion is to let it be your choice and to choose to believe it. That's what makes it so strong. But by what makes it strong also tells you that God himself knows that this is not the only way. And he's not the only thing that's true. And it is a game. Very, very um, intoxicating game, like going into a casino. Christians are addicted to God, the same reason that a gambler is addicted to gambling. Because of the, the losing that they're always doing. And they get good at being losers and offering their loserdom. Like, it's good that I'm losing so much because that means that God loves me. Because, of course, you have to lose in God's world. That just shows that God cares. That just shows I really care. Hey! Da -da 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 -da. It's like the offspring. Da -da 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 -da. The more it hurts, the more it shows you really care. Uh, uh, uh. I like the Osprey. <laughs> I like that song. It's just, you know, it's part of English culture, right? Some of them wanna hurt you, and some of them gonna get hurt by you. Some of them wanna abuse you. Some of them want to be abused. Yeah, it's always that strange division in God's world. And God tells you he's not in heaven. God tells you that every possible human humiliation is counted against you. I mean, who would do that? He says, I can murder and declare myself innocent. Now, in all of that, all of that, in no way is an argument that proves you shouldn't and no one should love God. None of it. But I, I do like Islam and Judaism better because, I mean, religion, they do religion for what it's for. It's, it's, it's not really to win arguments with people who don't believe what you believe. It's, it's about being a good person. And to me, it's also like you're allowed to study. You're allowed to, you know, examine the world, love the world. Hey, you know, do it for God. 
go understand something a little bit better. And I got that. I got that from the school system and Christianity. That's why I do what I do. I'm obviously, I think that the world, no matter what it does to me, can keep my hunger for knowledge. And and we're all, we can be forgiven for being a little bit arrogant and having our own opinions about what's worth knowing. And when I would just go to the library and get Don Juan or Betty Edie about dying or, you know, or whatever I was looking into, um, I was just practicing being on a quest that, felt safe within uh, my little world. I'm okay with that. Every person going on the internet or studying something for themselves is they're on a little quest. They're studying riverboats or they're studying horses or, you know, catfish. It's just, it's a lovely quest. All kinds of learning. I'm always interested in what people have learned and taught themselves and found out the fish or they look at the stars. I'm always interested. But I don't like it when people get pissy about what I think I know or that I have an opinion on something. You know, and, you know, narcissistic people don't want to talk about anything they don't always know everything about, you know, and, and, and that, that really puts you off of wanting to talk. So, you know, we don't live in such a free and open society around white Christians. You think you're going to have a nice talk at a coffee shop? But also just from the education system, I've talked to young people, 16, 17, at coffee shops. And they're all right, but I wouldn't say that they're... I mean, it, it makes sense, like, the way I grew up. I mean, I don't expect more for them than I could. It's not a lot of intellectual development. For me, that came way, much later on. You know, I, I got more knowledge of critical thinking from being in the flat earth, which is a kind of death cult. It's very Christian, and people don't see that. But um, <clears throat> and, uh, you, you can get it anywhere. I mean, you, you, in a way, I had to find something I liked and to try to defend it and listen to how other people throw the book and try to break it down. And so not to me, the great thing about Flat Earth, the people that attack you are pretty much as stupid as you are. So, you know, it's actually a useful learning in my eyes. <laughs> Fuck your mother. Fuck your mother. I mean, isn't that what we tell children? Pick a point and defend it. Maybe later on you can see or you come to a good school where like in a more private, more expensive school, they'll teach you how to take the view of the person who's debating to debate both sides. Look at that person if he's innocent. Look at that person if he's guilty. What do you think? They get all the possible points of view. Listen to everything. Listen to it all again. Then, you know, then whatever conclusion you arrive at, huh, I mean, imagine how amazing that would be. You know, a lot of people don't want to go the distance, you see. They want to get to conclusions very quickly. Or they're around people that they just like arousing conclusions in people. And I, that's, that's, that's lowbrow kinds of knowledge, spiritual slogan. Hey, if you believe in unconditional love, sure do. All right. We obviously believe the same things, brother. All right. Let's, let's you know, here's my card. Come and let me give you an anal massage on the weekend. I don't think if I didn't hear white people talk about unconditional love that the phrase would have ever occurred to me in all my life. Ever. Uncondi like, it just doesn't roll off my... It's not natural to me. <laughs> Love's not difficult enough for white people. You have to make it unconditional. It's already fucking got nothing enough fucking conditions on it. And too many all at the same time. How do you do it? Well, I think it's the culture. I think it's a lunar death cult. It's death looning. And God is a God of death. He's not even really alive. And he tells you that. He's telling you all the time. You read the book. I mean, it's the Bible. It's um, He's telling you it's all about death all the time. Just like English poetry is telling you it's all about death all the time. Adonai is a death rattle. It's beautiful. It's the same thing that the rabbits in Watership Mound are doing when they're, they're, they're getting fat on the farmer's free food and they're getting hooked by a silver cord every now and then, which they associate kind of with the moon. The author knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. And they give beautiful speeches about life and death and dark and light, but they never actually say. So there's something they're all living around, like a curse, which they've taken to be life. And the rabbits, the, the wild rabbits, they, they know a little bit maybe about the harshness of nature, but they don't want this. They'd rather starve than live this way. And so that book was written for people like me. 
watershed down. It was written for the wild ones, you know. And they do. They want we want what society has to offer, but we maybe don't want to participate as much, and that's people don't like that. It's, you see that maybe in indigent looking, you know, indigent looking, kind of poverty stricken, crackhead seeming, schizo seeming people. I think white people, like I've said now for many months on my channel, off and on, that a lot of white people have to see you that way. They can't help it. That economics itself, as much as they are trained in, through all the British colonies to notice economic problems, um, and not always, but and quite often cannot help but but um, limit the provisions that they themselves would take as the highest things that they could hope to offer and receive from other white people as to your personal dignity, what your achievements, what your life is worth, really, to the world. And they don't know what they're doing because they've been trained to do that. And to, to, to me, they just seem like psychopaths. I can do the same thing. You know, I could look at a homeless person and say, like, well, I want to trust them. I think that they're going to, you know, be able to tell me about a good book while they're on crack. Or but a crackhead, a woman, did come up and I chatted for a bit. And she offered me a book of poetry that she found in a used bookstore that she thought that I'd like. And sure enough, it's got lots of beautiful poetry in it. I still have it. It's got a beautiful hard cover and a nice book. So how, she, you know, she shared some other more intangible beliefs and then she moved on. She told me she was sad. She met a guy and she'd made a turkey one day to try to have some kind of domestic normalcy and they left her. She was really upset. Can you imagine you know, all your life was based on that? And you don't think that you know, having crack addiction is it's going to make you feel better, of course, and that may seem obvious to us, but at the end of the day, that's sad, isn't it? She's giving something to me. So, yeah, it's not always what you think. I still have that book. And how many people have given me a book that I keep on my bookshelf? Zero. Just her. She's a cracker. So, what are you up to? You know what I mean? What about all these other white people who never offer me a decent book? Am I supposed to think less of them? Like, is that the way we're supposed to? No. People being people. And in other more populated areas with more culture, people understand that very easily. People are people. You don't say get a shower to someone, but you don't have to invite them home either. I've, I've gotten a bit obsessive compulsive. Even though I'm a little bit, you might say, a little rough and tumble, I think people are dirty. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to know what's in their undershorts. gave mine to the military, they'd probably burn it. <laughs> so, shut up. Imagination. Staggers. <laughs> <laughs> and so will they. <laughs> You're going to be fined three dollars. <laughs> Relaxing, okay, but if the weather's going to change, I'm going to have to start walking. So I'm going to come out here one day. The day will come. A few, few weeks, you know, of maybe being a little bit optimistic. When I'm saying, hey, I'll have my sweater on and maybe a jacket. And, you know, like, okay, guys, I can only do this for so long today. And then I, you know, and the thing is, as the winter, as the autumn progresses, I can spend a lot of time actually still sitting in, you know, not so nice weather. I can because I practice doing that. But by, you know, November, that, that you know, parts of October, it comes, you know, pretty difficult, and eventually I'm just going to start walking. <laughs> hey guys, and then, you know, by the middle of December, it's like, I'm walking 16 miles today because that's what you got to do when you're out in the cold. <laughs> I don't usually walk 16, I probably walk 8. See how the mind exaggerates? 8 at most, but it feels like 16. It's kind of like when they say the temperature is minus 2, but it feels like minus 20. <laughs> it's like, hmm. I like that when they use the word feeling. I have like, you know, it's zero, but it feels like minus six. And you know, it's 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 very correct. 
in that way. I love that. That's a really interesting little, you know. So if I say the day, it's a nice day, but I, it feels like shit, you know, you can really think. <laughs> it says, the sweater says, you be. I've had this since, um, I've had this sweater since probably, like, 1994. Is that six, 30 years I've had this sweater, 30 years, my brother gave it to me 30 years ago, I wear it all the time, and it's still, I mean, it's well made, you know, it's amazing, it's like, I, you know, throughout the winter, it's more of an undergarment, I sort of forget the raw weather, I suppose it won't last forever, and what I'll do when it's done, it's the longest I've ever owned uh, an article of clothing. And it's great because it's... I used to have another sweater like this, but um, a woman stole it. I invited her into my house to stay the night. She had mental issues, and she stole my sweater, you know. And uh, so it's it's got a really nice little synthetic material. It's got beads on the bottom of it. And it's not orange. I think the fact that my sweater was orange is a little bit, you know... Maybe it's a good thing she took it. I hope she enjoyed it. I pictured her wearing it and just feeling like she had something that was hers. It's not stealing if you let people have it. It didn't feel good, but I didn't get mad at her for it. I just shouldn't invite stealing people into my house. And then it's like poor people on poor people. It's like, I don't have anything and I live on welfare. You took my favorite sweater. You know, it's like, because I can't afford to buy another one. It's not very nice, but I don't know what the fuck I was inviting her over here for. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, I thought it'd be nice, you know, like, you know, be a stupid or something. Like, you know, she's staying at a and b for free, you know, and would go the next day. I thought, okay, as long as... And, uh, but no, she, she really is. And the thing is, she shouldn't have wanted to be my... I think she wanted to be my roommate, but she shouldn't have wanted to be. That's the thing, I, you can't... It's not just her, you can't rely on white people... Like, I had a roommate, or, you know, uh, had his own business, and he probably, it turned out that he, I don't think he really liked me that much, and he didn't really have to stay with me. So, why did he stay with me? Uh, and I should have been more particular with him, too, but it's like, clearly we weren't meant to live together, and, you know, maybe we both didn't, he didn't seem to like me. It's like, I wonder why he agreed to this. Um, and then the, the woman, couple women before that, I mean, they just eliminated me. You know, women do that. They have a kind of rage towards men. Like, the people in my building have a lot of hidden rage. A lot of older women, you know, big women, they have a lot of hidden rage towards men. And I'm like, well, you know, I just have to watch out and respect it. It's it's one of my gods. You know, I have gods that have to do with respecting my natural enemies, my white people. You know, they are my gods, and I fear that god. It's a terrible god. The god of the white man is named Loveless, forlorn, life-sucking vampire. I mean, it's just, you know, I don't I don't even need to read your Bible to know that that's your god, because that's how you are. And I, I'd like to believe it's God, so I can blame your god, and I don't have to blame you. Because it, it's so much about who you are, you shouldn't be blamed for it, you know? White people are really quite loveless human beings. They're, they have very little to offer. There's a poverty, and you can't blame a homeless person for being poor so you can't blame a white person for being love poor you know spiritually the most poor people on earth are white people and they're the ones always fucking moving their mouths about how to be spiritual it's just you got to have some fucking humility see some other cultures see how islam does it see how judaism does it see how the sikhs are doing things and the buddhists and i don't necessarily want to go to a monastery or a mosque or anything but um but I just, just have some appreciation that you're not the only one who figured out a way to live in the world, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And, you know, it should be a joy to be around someone in any religion. Like, hey, you know, come hang out with us. Hey, you know, and a lot of cultures and religions are very generous and very hospitable. They're not going to be like, hey, you got to cut your foreskin off if you want to come back, you know. That's ridiculous. They're more secure than that. Christians are parasitical, you know, it's, it, it feeds, I think, a very starved part of the mind, a mind quite capable and, as necessary, in deluding itself, 
say that language, like this Bible, that is very ambiguous, duplicitous, and I think bad for the human mind, but by and large a kind of universal cultural standard now, anywhere that white speaking people go about their lives. So, and you see it in the art and entertainment too. This, this, these odd figures of speech. It is like a, like the word honeymoon. It's, it's not a very nice phrase. Has anyone ever looked that up? It's about the very short-lived but sweet death of the love of one's marriage. It's like you're getting married to celebrate the death of your love. I've said that many, many times on my channel. And then I looked up the word honeymoon, and that's basically what it is. It's all around you all the time. It's like the medium of white love is death. But it may be that whatever I'm talking about is good for you. White, a lot of white people seem to benefit from that. They're doing well. In a way, it's a cultural custom that is legitimized, but could be very dangerous to someone who doesn't necessarily speak the language. It's not about whether you can pay money in their church. It's more like whether or not you can speak their language. Which is often certainly where it parts and where it works a very physical like so it can be very physically absurd to be preyed upon by. And certainly economically or not, white Christian people, certainly by economics and other things of rank and status or relative poverty, can sort of turn on you in charity or hate or anything else in the most passive aggressive way. And to claim something from you while well, without being while being completely unconscious of it. Because when you eliminate things from people, out of especially out of love, you're you're if it's you're, you're taking from it without even knowing, you're eating it, you're consuming it, you're feeding upon it. We feed upon what meets with our insufficient recognition and respect. To just acknowledge something, to acknowledge the humanity of another person, is such an important thing. But if two people meet, something is allowed to happen between their two brains that is inappropriate for one and both people, then yes, violence starts to rear its head. I think that no white person has ever really had a balanced, healthy relationship with their mother or their father or anyone else. I could be so bold as to say that. And probably never will. It's a very orphan -y world. It's love is more about money than anything else. And the, but the money is like a cult into which they place all of their love. It's interchangeable. So white people wait for their parents to die so they can get the money to pay their debts. Debts accrued with the knowledge that they'll be able to pay them with the death of their parents, upon which every unit of money has already been amortized anyway. It's the cult of chasing the, the, rep, the surrogate father. And it's a cult of the surrogate father, which is a cult of the death of the father. Father sur surrogacy, paternal surrogacy, is a critical part of the pyramidal and thus triangular, people forgetting the pyramidal structures of patriarchy and hierarchy, is a triangulation because language is a triangulation and it's either life enhancing or it's asphyxiating, it's strangling. So over Christianized society, we have a kind of strangling situation. You'll notice in Dr. Arkhazanov's books that he, he talks about a lot of his patients behaving as though their brain would starve for oxygen at some point in early life in a way that it's never been dissuaded that it may have to be prepared to almost die from inability to breathe at any time. In the way that my mom is awake, I gave her half sleep apnea. The body's traumas can come close to suspending the ability to continue breathing, much like Oliver Twist. It's, a, it's an artifact of abandonment, much like anything else. And of anything else, also abandonment itself of any kind, by any order, is, is such a deep, penetrating shock to a young human. And the culture and the language, even if you come from a nice home, seems to prepare you to live according to that language. And that in itself, and the surrogacy that it breeds in children, the, per, the paternal surrogacy, for all kinds of purposes, laudable and whatnot, um, um, it, it leads to uh, putrid conditions, corrupting influences. Now any system of white people can be corrupted, impregnated, and possessed by all sorts of aggression and disparities and injustices.
this and the things, or who did what to whom, or who's doing what to whom, or, you know, what happens to them, you know, the silent rage and anger, the hurt that continues to breed. Um, and then you see why white people engage so much violence for them, and so many revenge fantasies in our age. Um, it seems to me, uh, having a psychopathic father and having a number of child psychiatrists, and child psychologists, and psychiatrists throughout my life uh, for different things, and how piss poor it was, and now watching TV, which is so well written when it comes to human behavior, it makes me think that all white psychologists and psychiatrists should probably do a few years of training with Hollywood screenwriters, don't you think? Who seem to know more about human beings than they do. Uh, absolutely, it sounds like a very rhetorical to say, but I really think that there's some kind of fertility should go on there because these screenwriters are trained better than they are. Because I said to my mom, it's amazing how many times my dad was in the room with them and they never diagnosed him with anything or thought there was a problem. And while that probably is common for a lot of forgivable reasons, we also just, it's very hard to take considering how far they went to advance my father's interests over mine well into my 20s and 30s. It's, uh, that's, it's going way off the track there. And, I, you know, obviously we didn't have a good, maybe the way I came into that or whatever, you know, we did not have a good experience of each other or whatever. Maybe if I did it again, maybe someone else would have a much better experience, but it just didn't work for me. It just spit me out, chewed me out, spit me out. And, uh, and it's hard to really come down hard in the sense that my dad is a very masterful liar. Um, and he will read some work in psychology. So it's very hard to pick out psychopaths and alcoholics because they're so good at lying. And, and everyone's trying to be fucking polite. So, you, you know, if you want psychologists to be better, at least in Canada, you're going to have to change the laws. You're going to have to change the profession. You're going to have to change the culture. Um, again, it's, it's not about even making psychology psychiatrists better. We have to become more aware. And I think TV seems more aware than they are of what people really suffer from. Um, you know, that dealing with a psychopath is not something where you call the police and they're taken away and you go on with your new life in a um, witness protection program. It's uh, a family like that is like leaving a cult, but you don't want to leave everything back to something that can still work without that parasitical thing that everyone ties to. By the time you're getting hurt enough to be able to feel bad about it, it's it's really got its hooks in you. It's got its hooks in the whole family. You know, again, also a reason why psychologists can't do anything about it, you might say. So it's it's, it's not a problem that we as a society have figured out how to do something about it. Which comes down to, you know, I think the, the very deaf, lunar, leaning, heroic nature of our entire language system and culture covers up a host of sins while it's busy relieving you of them. Because in the Bible itself, every humiliation is equated with a sin for which you owe money. Money itself are units of debt or sins. They're a breach and they're how you heal the breach. Who pays for it? How much? I'm just paying for shit all the time. I would go to counseling and I have more shit I'd have to pay for. And everything that I had was, no, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. How's your day? That's nothing. What do you like working on? What's nothing? What's on your mind? That's nothing. You know? They were listening more to my dad than they were listening to me into my 20s and 30s. You know? And that's, you know, by keeping him around, of course, and letting him come some of these sessions. It was just, uh, it was more important for me to do that. I, was th that. I would rather do that and be confronted with the horror of my father's disease. Um, even to the point, I, I didn't have time to get mad at the psychiatrist. Then, I, and in a way, it was for the best. Better to look at it and be shocked the fuck into you know, some other life than to be able to, as you don't want to, to delude yourself into thinking it's not so bad. Uh, you know, even if my dad just was so good at lying that almost anything could could make him do that, that that's enough to warrant staying in prison. You're, when someone's lying, they're not thinking about you or your safety or that of your siblings or any of it. So, you know, I had to abandon ship. You know, for my dad, it was a mutiny. 
brother is a ninja. So my sister is a ninja. They didn't understand. Because their dad is like their cult leader. They get their hooks into it. You know, I don't know a family where a, psych a psych psychopathic, patriarchal figure that can have enormously healthy and influence over the children. And anyone else that has any sense can on your mama just traumatize and simply be fucking, you know, numbed by the rumination that is out there. Anything to do with trusting this person. It's just like, how can someone be such a an unfaithful, parasitical human being and be hooked up to someone? Agreement that A, there's a problem, B, this person is bigger than any of our problems, and we need to find some way of taking steps to, to respond to it, respect it to a father or not. The only people who ever did that was in the first 15 minutes to a half hour I brought my dad, as I brought my dad to various healings and other things. This is one he really wanted to come to because they were, you know, kind of taking away from him as far as he knew. But, you know, and that allowed him to kind of again show his true colors. Because I could see both. I could see that some intelligent people want me, my dad wants me. It was just, you're bringing two kinds of people with a certain agenda together, but they diagnosed him with psychopathy in 15 to 30 minutes and had a pretty good, respectful, sobering discussion with him about it. And he just left and threw away the information that he got what he wanted. He just wanted to show me that there were nothing. That's all he came in to do. He didn't care what I said. Interesting. Of course, he proved him right. I wasn't there for a long time. To go from reading the books to going to the church is a big leap, right? Especially when you're paying $200 a pop. In fact, it's so expensive. That's why a lot of people probably don't get caught in it. It's very expensive. So. You have to be Tom Cruise to enjoy it. Their idea is that the strong become stronger. The self-reliant become more reliant. You know, if you're willing to get yourself here, it shows that you want to take care of yourself, which means you should be able to pay for your own healing. It's a business. Operating like a church, which is their prerogative. Remember, they don't have to pay any state licensing boards. They don't have huge, steep loans in order to give you auditing and stuff. So there's not a lot of outlay <coughs> for them to suck up a lot of money for you know, pretty decent therapy, you know, depending on you know, how it works for them. I won't say that it's bad therapy as much as almost anything could be therapy, but I didn't want to keep paying. I wish, you know, I wish it was what I be and people that stay in it. It's nice. It's nice. You, you go into an office and you see like a, a laminated huge poster board of your journey from going from pre-clear to clear. And if you read Dianetics, that sounds like a pretty amazing fucking thing, you know, <laughs> so to do. And I was really, I was really, and then the other levels, OT, one to nine, you're like, it just gave you like this heavenly structure. You could just take an elevator and go into these elevators. That's what every cult does. And it, it felt wonderful that, you know, school never did this. It was it was the periodic table. What does that have to do with anything? I'm not going to go from Benesium to Heptium in my lifetime. You know? <laughs> so, Benethium to over them. <laughs> Benethium to bigger than. You know, people uh, in different in different agendas see different things. So I was good to get different angles. The psychiatrists that let my father be what he was, they were also just being polite to what they knew as somebody's father. And they both took him at his word. He was a good liar. So gave me a lot to think about. And so did a lot of abuse, but... I've never seen therapy as not violent. You know, I would say getting a dental appointment is less violent than doing therapy with a white person. I would never agree with that. They're just not experienced enough. The culture isn't sophisticated enough. The language isn't sophisticated. I mean, these people, if they have a degree in psychology or psychiatry, they should get degrees in other things too. 
you know, you should be interested in knowledge. Go get some anthropology. Go get a lit degree. Um, go to a seminary. Um, you know, get dip your toes in a cult. Go and cry under the moon with some Kuwaiti doing, you know, huge community society. Just go get some experiences. You know, just get in awe of your own pain and grief or that of others. Go vomit in a cave with someone taking ayahuasca. Just just follow David Icke or Alex Jones for a few years. Get angry, get mad, cut your hair, grow it longer, and just, just do some things to figure out what freedom is to you. And then sit down in a room and listen. You know? But a lot of these, these people, they just live in a room with books that they don't even understand and see that they might as well have printed out on them which is for all they're worth really. I mean, but they're not, they're not, it's not that they're not earnest. It's not that it's not work to get these degrees. It's just that, you know, I think a lot of them think way too highly of themselves. They don't, they don't see the landscape at all. They're good at talking to people. I don't doubt that a lot of people can feel like they're enjoying their therapy. Um, and I take the view, as some people do, that it's not really doing what they think they are. And it's a view that I have. It doesn't mean that I pronounce all therapy wrong, but it's a view that I have. And that view comes with my experience and lack thereof. But it is a view that I take. And, um, not everyone in life is one trip. You don't be like all up and you know, go on this road. You have to be enthusiastic about it. I've had to either be clinically depressed or at least something confuses me about the idea of you know, I think people don't realize that, you know, when you get good therapy, you're the one doing all the work. You're opening, you know, a beginning with a therapist to me is like talking to any narcissistic sexual predator. The first thing they're going to do when they come up to you is make you comfortable, but yet, you know, put you into an overly close environment where, you know, getting more into your ease and sharing more, or letting them share more than you normally would is, you know, is like a rapport that they can return to every day and every time they see you for all time. It's basically the same thing. You know, I feel like I'm something in the palm of a shit weevil's hand. You know, I, I'd love if, you know if I could get into a room and, and sit down because I've I've sat across from guys some female naturopaths and stuff. You know, you know, and they're nice enough, but you know, again, white people they can be completely full of shit in earnest. And really need to be for reasons that just they might be forgiven for having nothing to do with you while sitting there and just dismiss your whole life at a glance and then after two thousand dollars and a year later do it again in just a different way that shows that we've been on a different plane since the moment I walked in here but a nice comfortable place to lay on your back and have a nice white woman put needles in your body for half the time and, you know but uh, I try not to say like you know they're full of shit because that wouldn't really convey the same thing would it I mean, I chose to be there, and they were in earnest, and they got some kind of degree to call themselves an MD, and it's all very healthy, and I'm sure every health food store in the world recommends naturopaths because they're all amazing, because it's got the word nature in it, you know, it's just like, what? And that's basically it, they don't do anything, these are not medical degrees, like, now you can become a doctor without having anything like a medical degree, I have a medical degree if a naturopath has a medical degree like I could probably do more for most of their patients than they could right because anybody could you know we would be blessed by our complete ignorance about other people's problems it's like I don't fucking know you know you'd save them money because I couldn't charge anything because I couldn't do anything <laughs> yeah, come see me for free you'll get more than paying them for nothing It's useless. It's a placebo. You know? So when you're hurt, and you've got these malfactored emotional trauma, stress, trying to eat well, and thinking you need some help because, you know, a naturopath is like where a lot of people will go if they're scared of therapy. They will, you know, they'll be like, you could say, like, my mother beat me and my dad raped me, and they'll be like, ah, what a betrayal. Well, you know, that wasn't about you, and nor is the rest of this therapy. So lay down and let's let all your pain soak out the bottom of your feet. And I got this mister. It's one hundred dollars, and it will take away all the boogie boogies until you come back next time in about three days, and we'll do it again. <laughs> you know, and it's you know okay. 
feel like, you know, who doesn't want to tell people all of their emotional problems and say, ah, it's not about you, it's not to do with you. Let's do these other things. <laughs> You'll be glad you came. <laughs> You're just a regular Joe. You know, they're not psychologists, so they don't have to listen to you for five minutes. They, it's like their computer is take everything about you and turn it into something they can sell you. That's their job. Okay, that's their training. Are you like, what are you there for? I mean, they're there to make money. They haven't taken any oaths to help you. You'll never go into a naturopath and say, well, I've taken an oath to help you. The same mouth I used to kiss my mother's you know, cheek, I have said that I will do my fucking damnedest to not be a complete cunt to the needs you bring to my office. And if I can't help you, I'll fucking tell you. That's my job for you before you pay a fucking cent. And if I can't do that in 30 seconds, I suggest you leave. It's attitude. Same attitude that Caesar Milan takes to training a dog. But they sit there, they're all fucking relaxed. And I say to you, white naturopath, you look too fucking relaxed. It's like, what are you running? Are you giving the State of the Union? Are you playing dress up? What the fuck is this about? You know? Look more fucking serious. I've seen more serious people trying to sell me fucking anal cream. You know? And what it is, is just a one-stop shop to a bizarre range of new age hoodoo, acupuncture, Chinese medicine, you fucking know it. All the keywords. Are there and it's going to get even weirder over time and hypnotherapy and it's just that one stop shop you know you don't have some fat woman with a hair lip and a crystal ball and questionable personal hygiene no you've got this nice montessori school um, waldorf school uh man or woman sitting there absolutely earnestly as a chiropractor ready to take you through the healing process <laughs> you know it's like fuck you fuck you you're not a fucking doctor okay my message to all white naturopaths and chinese doctors and doctors of chinese medicine you're not fucking doctors you're not fucking doctors stop calling yourself healers that's a fucking lie you're hurting yourself you're living in delusion okay get a life I've lived around people like you for like a decade of my life. Fuck off. Really. It's a lifestyle choice. Enjoy it. Stop molesting people for your fucking white religion. I got more out of the flat earth than all white healers combined. Because at least it gives you a voice. Scientology gives you a voice. You feel like you're somebody. These people, like, you know, they don't have the spirit in their blood anymore. They spent their lives from school to church to everything else convincing them how fucking amazing they are. They haven't been humiliated enough. They should go to a Buddhist monastery where someone fucking hits them in the balls with a cane until they cry. Yeah? Now you know some fucking humiliation. And you won't sit there and say, oh, you were sexually abused? Oh, that wasn't about you. Let's move on. They don't know what pain is. It doesn't mean they're not in pain. It doesn't mean they haven't been fucked over their whole lives because that's what white culture does. But they don't have enough pain on their mind. They look too fucking comfortable. I want to see some native man with grooves on his fucking face, man. That has compassion and understanding. It looks like they get their psychological hands dirty on a regular basis. Huh. 
not someone floating around and doing the last rites for people's dogs or <clears throat> selling the latest voodoo witch cream. They're all charlatans. But they do believe it. They believe it in earnest. That homeopathy can change your life. Ask any white homeopathist, can it change your life? You know, you might get suspicious, like, change your life? What do you mean? You can only change your life with hard work, dedication, and faithfulness combined with $200 of homeopathy. <laughs> that makes it work. Because they'll never even say that the homeopathy itself does anything. You have to believe. Of course it doesn't do anything for Rain Griffin. He doesn't believe enough. Do you know how many fucking years I would drop little flower essences from Vox over my body, hoping it would take my fucking pain away? Because it was cherry blossom and that works on sexual trauma and shock? I, I don't want to, I'm not going to slap that out of somebody's hand. I've used it myself. A million, million things that calm the mind that I would go back to in a second without having, you know, if I didn't have to live in the pain I might do today, knowing that I can't go into those worlds to do anything about it anymore. So I just sit with it and go into shock, sitting in places like this. So don't think that I haven't just, well, as you know, you, if you're a white person, you've already categorized me as a poor person anyway, right? And even with all this space, you see me as somehow confined or imprisoned. Your world is so much more free than mine. You know, you're, you're not trapped in the mind that I am. You don't want to live with my mind. Well, here's the news, I don't want to live with yours either. Nobody, the only true thing I've heard from spiritual people is this one Indian guru says, no one wants to live in your mind. That's humbling, isn't it? I mean, fuck. And also, by the way, as it should be, it makes everyone feel safe. It's like the non-psychopathic firefighter on TV who says to a child, you know, I'm going to pick you up after school tomorrow and raises his eyebrows because he's trying to negotiate with a young boy who's lost his father, right? who's angry and confused and children can't control that and it's perfectly natural and he needs to know that how he feels is okay and that people love him. I, I learned that because they tell you that on the show. <laughs> but it, it makes sense, right? And um, the DSF is looking at it because they're making sure like that your first focus is the children, not even what you're doing for their father, but you're obliged to them. And I like hearing that stuff on TV. Your obligation is the children, not why you're doing it for them, not the fact that you promised the parents that you would do it but that you are actually properly in service of what they actually need and not in the name of this or any nice sounding thing. It's really quite an informative moment. And then a white woman comes in and lies so you can get away with it. I mean, that's just part of the show. And, you know, you're trying to be a good person. He is. You know he's going to be there for these young men. They can't. But that doesn't mean that he should be. It doesn't mean that we have a right to lie. So it's, it's, a, it's a TV show. We have the omniscient view, so we judge it fair. You know, it's like, how many times do we watch shows and the characters lie? We are the judge, and we go, that's okay. <laughs> They're our friends. <laughs> they meant well. And his name is Joe. But really, characters on TV lie all the time. It's the same reason Christians can say, I don't let my children watch TV. You know, sex, violence, but also, everyone's lying to their parents all the time. If you're a good Christian, you shouldn't let your children watch TV. They're always lying to everybody. But he, lean, he leans down and he raises his eyebrows, which is a passive-aggressive body language in many cases. But he's saying, believe me, I'm going to pick you up at school. And also, I'm going to pick you up at school. And it's saying, like, this is as, as, as aggressive as I'm going to be to you. Because the, it's a passive-aggressive thing to raise your eyebrows. It's like, please do this, but also you're going to do this. But also, please do this. He's appealing to him. It's going to happen, but I, I really, this is all I can do to appeal to you. And it actually works well, you see. That shows you, like, characters, TV stars are very good at that, at using body language, and we're good at listening to it. So we know, like, okay, Lieutenant Casey really means well. This, he's not raising his fist. Even though he's bending over, it's like his hands are at his side, and he's raising his eyebrows saying, I'm not trying to threaten you. I'm just coming down to your level and telling you that's what I'm going to do. Right? I'm dedicated to you. I'm not going to hurt you. And that's an important thing for a person to convey to a child, like, uh, you know, provided that they are an appropriate person, right? You can use body language to manipulate children the same way, right? And that's the scary part of it. So, but one way or the other, we are intelligent beings. 
And it's important that children have people who have the right attitude and convey whatever body language in a way that makes sense. Because then when someone else uses it, it doesn't make sense, right? Then it is not consistent. So the, the more the body language can sing and be there and be that triumphal and consistent thing to your child, the better. And what better way to do that than to be honest with them in age-appropriate ways, right? But not to be lying to them at any time in age-appropriate ways, right? So there's no appropriate time to lie to anyone. But you can't just tell a child the, the truth either all the time. Like, what happened to the kitty cat? You know, they went to heaven, which is the truth, but it's not the truth, you know, that is like all the truth that you really know and feel as an adult, necessarily. You can't deprive the child of that, but you don't want to overload their life with, you know, just that they're gone and they'll sleep and you can have a little funeral and their life will go on. That's what it does. And that's what we do. And we're good at that, as long as we don't have too much to deal with. But that doesn't mean that a child can't be credited with the ability to learn all kinds of sophisticated things of if, you know, to, to live in the world, but also to suffer from it. To have to be sad about things. No one taught me how to be sad about stuff. So they were watching World Vision commercial and there was a the little boy or girl who flies around in these giant bellies and a mother whose breast has lost its ability to milk and, you know, and is saying, you know, send money, these children need your help, and just starting to cry profusely. And I would not be consoled until my mom promised to call and donate twenty dollars. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I saw it as my money or I, I don't know if I had I don't even know if I even sent the money or maybe they sent me an envelope and I was like just, and even though it's, it's just a racket, I suppose, and that's exactly what a sponsor is supposed to do, the money is probably going to go to me, you know, that's how I feel now, but someone might have said, wow, you're really emotional about that, you know, I mean, in a house where no one really cried that much, it's like, yeah, it was a little more than just about what I was seeing on TV. In that way, sure, it's like, wow, what a compassionate little boy you are, but what a sad little boy I am, too. Yeah, in that way that my brain was telling me, that World Vision commercial in my mind is telling me, hey, you need to be a real person. You need to take money. You need to help. There was no picture of you on television. It almost makes you feel selfish saying that, right? What could I possibly need to be a person? You know, look at me starving away at my little verb and lifestyle. Watching the price is right and playing with myself. And, like I'm so I'm so starved for love. Especially with a parent that grew increasingly hostile to me for having needs that another human wasn't allowed to have, essentially, as I would see it now. Doesn't make you think that you should feel good about having needs, you know. That you should divert from just being completely grateful for what you learned to live with. You know, not come to the notion that despite having being happy, you could still be in pain, and despite having everything you need at a certain level, you could yet be deprived of things that you need, right? And, and you know, white people, and certainly not me or my family, really had any more sophisticated understanding of family than human beings. And I think millions of people still don't. And I'm talking to an audience of people that have grown up and grown around other people whose families didn't really know that or couldn't, and that poverty and industrial demands and of all different kinds, enter into the equation quite a bit. So maybe nobody knows what to blame. And then if you don't want to, you get tired of blaming yourself, maybe you need some kind of death-oriented religion. It's interesting that my white Christian friends would say that my poetry was too death-oriented, but yet they were worshipping basically a lunar death cult. So 
but we couldn't talk about that and say, hey, you know, this is what poetry does for me. This is what Jesus does for you. Because I wasn't allowed to call what I was doing a religion. That I was following anything as important as a supernatural deity of the Bible to help try to understand my life. And, you know, by the way, having all the humility that my God or goddess didn't need to ask of me because it was the medium in which I fucking lived. No one thinks at 12, 13, 15, 16, you know, with an abusive household that, you know, you're not overconfident about anything. So when I went onto the computer for the first time and wrote some poetry and some philosophy on the Tandy 1000 computer that someone had given me, and that white children who didn't even know me, my age or a bit younger, could basically start stalking me for being overconfident or arrogant or, you know, uh, assertive in some of my tiny little treatises that never needed to be anything more than what was appropriate to my limited age and experience with other people who have also limited age and experience. And why not? It's good, it's bad, it's interesting, it's funny, whatever, it is what it is, but why, why get hostile? And so that was my experience of white people. And it took a lot of my time in life because, you know, I, I didn't just see it for what it was, crazy. I actually thought these were sane people, and then I had to worry about myself, even anonymously on a computer for the first time, before the internet was really even invented. And that's what I found consistent through white people on Facebook or anywhere else. It's like, fuck. You know? I went on a poetry share site, and I'd put poetry, and they'd say, oh, you stole that from a book, you, you know, you're a fucking liar. And, you know, okay, <laughs> a good one. So... Kind of a backhanded compliment, I guess. But that one person, whether it was my amateur film or amateur poetry, whether it's good, bad, or whatever, but there's one person who would say, right on, man, this is amazing. <laughs> and that feels good, you know? A person can have a little pride, a little vanity. It's like, thank you. And you know what that really is? It's just... It's still a vain religious belief. Wow, I did something and someone felt a current or a charge. And like, yo, that's singing with me at some physical, mental level. Like, that's great. Yeah. And uh, it's not even what you're really looking for because you, you write it all by yourself and out of your own volition. And even though technically, how could one write or think anything or make a video without imagining that someone might listen to it? That's what our brain automatically does. Because talking in itself imagines an object, it imagines a receptacle. Before anyone had a god, they were probably talking to themselves in nature. And suddenly they realized it dawned on them that maybe something or someone in nature was listening. Based on how they noticed their life turning out. Or because they were delusional. And it came upon their various human beings that maybe they would invent a philosophy that would help them get the best out of that. While limiting the worst. Delusion. <laughs> Hey, you touch my stone, I'm going to kill you, you know? It's my sacred stone. <laughs> In how many ways do animals read menace unnecessarily? No one sees bears fighting or wolves and thinks this shouldn't be happening because of just the way they are in territory <coughs> or having young. But in how many ways, all told, do white people and their children and us or siblings turn or have people turn on them and have things suddenly turn and change. That turn on us and society or any of us at any time based on all the right kind of strategies, good, bad, rich or poor, what have you, that are formed in a roiling mass of, uh, of torture, essentially. A religion of torture. Uh, diff we have more probably words for death in white English culture than we realize than the Inuit have for snow. Or Dow Chemicals has for a spark tank. There are so many words in the English language that have negative, torturous, death-oriented connotations. And you can get there through all of its ass connotations. Even the last three words, uh, last letters, I-O-N and I-A-N, you can get there. That's how we're finishing a lot of our words, words even for major religions. Especially Christianity and God's interest in money and saying that all your humiliation 
counts as sin, debt, and money. It's all worth something. That's why the criminal system works the way it does. It's a subtle, necessary, and well brought up jurisdiction. It happens to be true or is true or, you know, when people are grinding, you know, their problems on the world, they, they think that that's true. Whatever. You know, satire. Like John Mortimer, a uh, retired lawyer, he made fun of it at one point, like his famous character. <clears throat> And more people, or myself, we can knock at it and throw sticks at the, the edifice of it all, but it works. And, you know, people eventually just get with it, or they end up poor talking to themselves on the internet. That's also true. It's true. And nor do the stick throwers, like myself, have to say that, you know, you, you don't really understand life, and you know, I'm better than you because I have a more pure, honest, down to earth you know, opinion about various things that nobody even listens to in my own life. <laughs> so nobody's worried. And that's nice. It's nice. Nobody's worried about that. Take care of our own. And I'm never going to walk around. I, But like an animal, I go on energy. People don't like me or I don't like something. You know, it doesn't matter the beliefs of these animals. Like wants to be around like. I feel too much about people. White people are very nervous. They are. They feel on edge. It's like uh, you know, with this niceness profile, dressed so wild, and I walked out. And it was really good. And the moment he walked up to me, I fell that day. So I was just getting up off the rock, and I feel like this. Things are turned out really nice. He just keeps to himself. I keep to myself, and we share the beach. You know, it's great. I don't want to make that difficult for someone. And I like it when people don't want to make that difficult for me because, you know, it's it's so possible. <laughs> but it also, like, if for some reason he didn't feel good about me or I didn't feel good, then that wouldn't be good because everyone's trying to feel good with everything. And I think it's not that white people don't work to feel good about anything. It's just that I have time. I'm usually at a distance to, to notice where body language belongs. And we, we can't notice those types of things and then say, it's your fault for making me feel this way, or this is what I see about your body language. And that, and, but in, in justice towards it, you know, I do get to indulge certain beliefs that I can form as I pick up on what I think are the body language of others. And I, I'm the one who has, to, I'm the only one who can suffer from that. Unless I'm delusional, and because of that, I make everybody suffer. Like if I, you know, I'm looking at them, it's like, hey guys, these guys look really fishy, you know. Oh, yep, look at that, they're looking at me. Oh, oh my goodness, look at those old fucking white people. Ooh. You know, that would not be a very smart way to go about things. <laughs> so if I find that people are looking at me, and they can have lots of innocuous reasons, and it's based on how I feel that day or how it feels. Um, but also when we as white people look at things, we also release a lot. We don't keep, we don't keep our energy. Like a, a distant dog, or there's some animals that look at a distance more, like deer, for instance. Or so I say, you know. Um, and I, sometimes I think we have very good eyesight, and then we look at you, and then we feel like we feel looked at, and then we can go off to do our thing. Um, or I just imagine that that's so much. That's just maybe there's a psychology to how humans see that on the other side. Um, but uh, and why and wherefore, and it turns out that everything we know is based on circumstance and personal experience. So how can anyone really know? <laughs> it's like it's something the universe got even more difficult. But that was the idea. Like, I can think everything just because I'm me, having the experiences that I have with a mind that could even just spend 99% of the time deluding itself that its feelings have anything to do with reality, let alone with anyone else's reality, while recording it. And the only thing we know is real at this point is YouTube and my beautiful Google 6 a That's real. But this could be unreal to someone. There could be very little that is realistic to them. It might even be like one day going, is he even really alive? He could be a robot. Maybe he's a Google bot. Maybe he's advertising Google. Maybe that's why he keeps mentioning his fucking camera. <laughs> it's like, you know, I start advert. People turn out, like, if they're making thousands of videos that I'm just advertising something. We could actually do a survey. Like, what do you think I'm advertising? <laughs> Mental health. 
Or maybe I'm a cautionary tale. What am I? Maybe the government has invented me to, to make people do anything but be me. Anything but me will do. Do anything but me if you need to do something or someone who's waiting for you. It could be love come true. <laughs> and go on with your wonderful loving lives. My life is half over, maybe three quarters, maybe a third. And if it was three quarters, it could have like seven more quarters. You say like, let's say if I said my life was three quarters over, what if my life could be up until nine quarters? I didn't say 75% over, I just said three quarters done. If my life is three quarters done, what is each quarter? 16, 17 years, three of those, three more, four, five, a hundred? What if I live to be as old as Moses? With my hair down to the ground, and a stick somewhere? And I tell you, I don't have time to dilly-dally around people. I'm old, I'm slow, the life somehow is caught up to me, maybe because I'm too slow. <laughs> I also sound like Jerry Seinfeld now, everyone. <laughs> I practiced for many years, <laughs> but then I want to be myself. I finally discovered at age 99 that all my problems had to do with being myself. <laughs> Fuck myself, got rid of that. I conducted a ceremonial and symbolic murder of myself live on YouTube. And I was free. <laughs> I was saying to my mom watching a firefighter show, and you know, it's great what they do and everything. I really respect. And you know, it's they do a good job showing it too and everything. And uh, I, I, I said to her, it's like I would not run into a burning building, even if I was a fireman, you know, I think of any reason not to. Um uh, and uh, what if a fireman got burned and they were in the hospital in a fictional sense? And uh, the doctor had to tell them that, nah, you know, he's okay, uh, but he has burns on 90% of his penis. <laughs> I, don't, I just thought that was funny. His penis is burned. Only his penis? Only his penis. We don't know why. <laughs> and he's, maybe he went to take a piss or something. Went to the bathroom, went to the bathroom during the fire. <laughs> it's like, I had to go. <laughs> Plus, I used my urine for a fire repellent purposes. So I think technically you should pay me more. I use my own biological fluids. It's it's in my contract. <laughs> and also, you're paying for a new dick. <laughs> I can't use this. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> but love your firemen and women. It's a great show because it's got lots of women on it too. So. And I, it's all about encouraging women to do the fire. Which I also think, as a show, like I wouldn't want to encourage people to do something that they could die doing. You know, that's not my that's not my racket, people. Like, go and play tennis. Don't be a fireman. It's a dangerous job. I was properly trained and so forth. You know, you don't have to exactly live and work in Chicago. You know. Um, you don't have to be the person that's rappelling down into the inferno to, to rescue a puppy or something. I don't think you have to do that. You could work in the office. You could, uh, you could clean the truck. <laughs> you could service some of the personnel in ways that they require. <laughs> Respectable Christian ways. Not the way that sick man on YouTube always likes to insinuate. Sometimes a fire hose is just a fire hose. <laughs> anyway, they're pretty good. But I'm sure they respond very quickly. Oh yeah, they're good. They're like, wow. Neighbors had a fire one day years ago. Smoke everywhere called them. And they were in Imo. They they were like the best thing about them. They were there and under fire. They did not care. I was like, wow. I took the pan off, I opened, and it was happy with them. So they didn't have to kick the door in. 
That's basically why. But um, lucky, I just left the pan on stroke. Something if you haven't done it, there's a good chance one day you will. So, I need your time right now. I'll bring time. Don't go out when something goes out. Never leave. Never leave. I don't care if the police are up there. Just say, I have something on the stove. And they'll be like, oh, okay then. Go we'll wait. They'll order Chinese. I like Chicago fire, it's just, but I, I like to be critical, and yeah, absolutely, it has a lot of the stuff I criticize about, you know, but it's dumb, I mean, writers, they, they need that. They have to make people do stuff that makes it interesting to watch, and they get them into situations, they have to get them out of situations in a way that maximizes what we can learn about the different people involved and release various kinds of stress about what we think is going to happen and how much we don't want that to happen to them and then what they're able to do to make sure that doesn't happen. That happens on this show all the time. You know? <laughs> I like a little resolution. Of course, like the drama, it never completely resolved. Like, I like Heartland, but I wish they released, oops, <laughs> I wish they released like a DVD set or whatever, um, where Lou Fleming, you know, I like the actress, you know, but where Lou Fleming and uh, her boyfriend, Steve, or whatever, um, I forget his name now, you know, it's highly forgettable, a highly forgettable relationship, they could just eliminate it from the whole show. And I would watch the entire series. Tim. No, Tim's the other guy. But they're all white names. Tim, Bob, Joe, Dave. So we're looking at Genesis. And we were talking about how the first word of Genesis is the letter G. Um, then you have the letter... at uh, 7, 6, and 9, uh, which is 13 and 24. That's the 13th room, which is the letter Y, which in a strange way is probably why it's written that way. In the beginning, we did a lot of this earlier, so I'm going to keep going. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, have people always believed that the heavens and earth were separate? Uh, and are the heavens to be stars, or are the heavens to be like the heavenly realms that people go to when they die? Um, it's not exactly clear, but I imagine white people pretty much assume that, Christians assume that. Um, because in different parts of the Bible, God makes it clear that the heavens that he's talking about, like, he doesn't live in them. Like, that there is no God in them. For 
just like a psychopath, you know, he tells people the truth. He tells you not to believe him. He tells, he says, obviously, the reason why Richard Dawkins or me could go in the Bible and say, look at this awful person, is because God gives lots of evidence that you shouldn't trust him. And in a strange sort of way, that's why it works. It's like a pimp. You know, we basically the pimp of the Christian faith. He just is able to foster enough of a dependency based paternal surrogacy in a whole society based upon a pyramid, the triangulation also of parental surrogacy, which is a language unto itself. And that's what this is. I mean, it's all, I call it a lunar death cult. Jesus is a lunar god. And just like the honeymoon, you know, anything like light in the Bible is usually a very short-lived thing because it's a realm of death. He is the God of death. So if we take it that way, let's look at it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say anything about their relationship. It doesn't sound like a very personal thing. It's just like something he did. It's just like a report. It's not personal. Like, today, God created the heavens and the earth. You know? At some point, God created the heavens and the earth. Whatever was created, if you ask a Christian, whatever was created, did God create it? Yes, because that's what it says. Everything. So we say, God is taking the name of the first sound and the first order of all the sounds and names of creation. Whether we need our mind to go back there or not, a language, at least in God's world, is something that goes back, or at least his goes back, and so his language goes back, whether our minds can go as far back as his does, into the first order, name, sound, reality of all things. It's a very important note. You don't have to do that for yourself, but it, you could also say that he's using, uh, while kind of abusing and eliminating, what people could have well understood about the nature of life, <coughs> like indigenous people, that their minds go back to the beginning. Because the mind, we use the mind like language exists in the prefrontal lobe, <coughs> prefrontal cortex, and whatever. But many human beings, I believe, have lived as though language is the whole thing. And Hollywood screenwriters and advertising know that language is everything. Bible writers know language is everything. Language is everything. It doesn't mean this is how you should think about it or think about it my way or, you know, spend the rest of your life just looking at things like words. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. I'm still saying everything everyone's saying. It's the same universe. It's words. It's not words. It's more than words. It's just your words. It's not the right words and, and so on. And it's things in itself, the same universe, but a universe where everything is language. Exactly the same that we've ever thought it was, in every scientific or religious way, but also all about words. And I think that that is what God is using. Right? That's what advertising uses. And in a sense, it's what we all use, and what is being used on us at a deep physical, emotional, mental level that can comprehend the totality of our minds, like the totality of our minds can comprehend more than we even know. And everyone can be forgiven for everything. It's a very powerful thing to start talking about. You know, you think I would start a religion, but I can't. You know why? Because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I would have to be able to repeat that. You know, like a good liar, I'd be like, okay, now let's say that again. <laughs> say that again, students. <laughs> say it this way. Say it exactly this way for all time. Or you're going to go to hell. <laughs> if you don't feel it, and I suspect you don't, pay me money. <laughs> I don't know. You have to be a good liar. You may not feel this way, but I invite you to feel this way because this is how I feel about my own work. It'd be nice to think that it, at some point it might add up to something. Understand that I don't mind feeling this way. Now, if that's something that makes someone uncomfortable because they're accurately picking up that, you know, check mark for you. So you feel that way. I could totally understand how people could feel that way. And I should try to be a little more clear about where I'm coming from more often. People would probably have an easier time listening to me and also deciding whether or not they wanted to. So they didn't become frustrated thinking that it was something that it wasn't. Does that make sense? And I want people to understand that I, I do try to listen to the comments you send. I do. And within certain bounds, because I'm also a bit irreverent when 
I read comments to other people. I don't mind if they're a bit mean, and you're just like ripping it off because this is enough pugnacious to you, but also you're doing your personal time like I do in the morning before I poop, writing whatever I feel on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. You know, quid pro quo. I will mute you, but that's okay. Because <laughs> I don't think you care. So we understand each other. <laughs> you know, and that's a physical thing between men. You know, I, I don't mind getting a message that someone isn't enjoying listening to this program. Or any of my programs. And there are so many. You know, <laughs> so that's okay. It's okay. It's all right. You know, I want people to relax. You know, I don't want to get people too worked up. But, you know, people, audiences, they want to be worked up. Do we want to be worked up? <laughs> I would, I'm sure I would rather, in some sense, watching you two. I think I've become a little more mature. But to be angry sometimes. I mean, I would watch police brutality videos. I would literally, and it would just make me pissed off like fuck every day before I left the house. And I'd be like, I, w I wouldn't go until I got angry. And I like, that's how I would start my day. You, you want to accuse me of being mentally ill, well, there you go. It seems like that. Huh? I, I don't like the characterization, but, like, if we could all be permitted to say, like, hey, I got angry driving that day, or, you know, I watched a lot of Asian porn, porn at the beginning of the Chinese New Year, because, you know, there's lots of dragon spoons and people in white coats. <laughs> I don't know. I never did that, but it just, you know, I, you know, no offense to anyone, but to Asians, but, like, everything that Asia does, I just, it's really quite amazing. It's so much softer. You ever just think that? Yeah. And then also, if you're thinking about porn, like, they look more resilient. <laughs> They're just in better shape. <laughs> Even the young white people, they, it looks like they could hurt themselves. <laughs> it's, it's really about... You know, energy and power. Whereas, like, I think Asians are like, it's just, just about feel. It's like, you know, white people in their porn are very visual. You know, big boobs and small vaginas. You know, just butts everywhere. It's really quite a haze. You know, and boy, a lot of cock sucking. Like, if you have to take porn as an indication to what men like, or at least what porn creators think, it seems to be like a fair amount of a tongue bath for the old, uh, the old 51 salute. <laughs> it's like, wow. Or do women have to do this? Is this, like, expected of people in a, in a relationship? Or I can understand maybe hookers, you know, maybe they're servicing, people are servicing the fantasies of men. Is that a male fantasy? Yeah. I don't know. It's, um, I know growing up masturbating, I would say, like, it's not something I really thought a lot about as a young man in my fantasies. Like, it hadn't occurred to me. Isn't that strange? That somebody would want to do that. So, you know, I have to say that, um, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't make someone do that, you know. <laughs> I just wouldn't. I just, it seems humiliating, you know? And while in the realm of male sexual fantasy, I suppose it's something that's almost de rigueur, you know. And nobody says that, by the way. No one says de rigueur, like, hello, of course, that must be de rigueur. Because <laughs> that doesn't enhance the experience. But no, I just, uh, I would be, uh, you know, I practice in my mind that if I'm ever in a position where a woman starts... Um, I've watched TV and they start fondling with your belt, and, you know. I'd be like, that's the point where I would just be like, no, you, you, I practice. No, no, thank you. But also, you're amazing. <laughs> and, you know, I know that I'm going to have to pay. <laughs> I know you're going to need to hurt me. I just don't go for the testicles, dear. Um, go for my, uh, my reputation <laughs> back at the workplace how small it is, and how stupid I am, and how disgusting I am. <laughs> I am disgusting. Veronica, more disgusting than you know. I've done things to myself that make me 
a shame. <laughs> and I could have shown you all of them, but not now. You've ruined it. Something in the way you looked at me is like it's beseech, beseeching a beguiled biblical character, doing something that she'd been trained to do. You and me were trapped in there, in a realm, in the ultimate prison. Ability of our minds to absorb all kinds of training and think that we could possibly know how to carry this off and come out better on the other side that would make it worth it. That we'd sooner get into the car of Veronica and just drive it into a wall without our seatbelts and see if the, the, the airbags would break our noses. reckless. It's not befitting a mature, free person who wants to recognize the sanctity of another being and to conclude any faithfulness to any of the articles of our faith and make that more important than anything else. You know, that's reality. It's not something I would actually say to you, but it's nice to say to you. To all of us. You can figure prominently that you follow the way of Christ in my heart and mind and my thoughts. You can just figure it out sight and see. I've got other things on my mind now. I just, I've, I've learned through a lot of training, you know, and as much as I've been in a lot of solitude, I tried to work sex out of my writing, not into it. Um, and it's, despite how much time I've spent writing, I've never figured it into any relationship I've even had with anyone. It's not like a badge I've ever worn on my chest. It's never had any currency for me, much less never selling anything. It's had no social currency in my entire life. Currently, just spending your life writing isn't worth it. It's not living around intellectually very mature people. You know, but also I'm living around people whose concerns are superior to those that, are, that, that I take note in my life. I'm rather found out, I'm rather unfit for um, appropriate treatment. And that is my God. You know, I have to, to let that God be. And God is a ferocious, malevolent, loveless thing that on your worst day, you know already will suck the life out of you. people in their life. It's not even that they're supposed to, but they exist. Take nothing else from them. Can't, won't, and I never expect them to ever. Imagine, you know, that I'm not very warm for meeting white people. I just, I expect nothing from them. I go on energy alone, and I'm very particular. A lot of people in my life exist, and many other things. I'm particular about the company of people that you wouldn't fuck over. Absolutely. Because it's just, imagine it being your single greatest health issue in life and having enough time, maybe even like in a prison cell of my personal trauma, having time to work it out. Never overly conscious of it, to walk around like a caged animal or a malignant narcissist, just to, just to keep every little quiet I can still at temple being in my body. Um, just to tell stories. Uh, it goes back to the foundations. First love I ever had was alive, and it's the fact that you can see it and it keeps me faithful. That's what I want to prove to you. You might think it's such a naive religion, and you can see why a lot of white people wouldn't do it because they they give that up. They give up all of the muscles of being human, the atrophies, totally. How many times they kneel and for what they do, that matters. And it's, to me, it, the, the, the range of that kind of universal atrophy of the white conscience, the spirit, the white body, the white culture, which almost sounds like you know, a pretty awful thing.
it's a, it's a thing that has a lot of morbid proportions. It's this kind of death worship. You would almost have to see them worshiping some kind of cult of death and money, and money to get into such a state to put your hearts into something that really sucks the melatonin out of your higher brain function. In that way that we could say when a person hears white, they said it represents a kind of people that can be white to the earth. And you start to think of how often the culture itself that these two people themselves are can have a very morbid effect upon the mind and make over time to me very scary impressions, terrifying impressions. When I sometimes reach out to myself of what white people are even capable of in a single calendar year between lying, theft, and malignant slander, you know, and I, I won't even go into details on all those sorts of things either. I, I go about my life and I allow myself to be disturbingly mesmerized and I, I reach out to myself knowing that white people are capable of doing it and they live very close to me. So yeah, I, 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 my mom and I keep ourselves pretty private here. Uh, it's, I don't need to go kayaking. The, the foundation of my heart and my home is always moving in some kind of tumultuous river when we are, in any sense, exposed to interacting with people that we live on. And it's better now, but like, <clears throat> I, just, I just won't go into it. And no one really knows what they're doing. No one thinks anything of it. And uh, it's just part of the culture. It helped me to understand that people like my mom and I are very agreeable. And it is it can be a difficult getting to be around certain people and experience. Other people, I've lived next to white people, a beautiful woman named Johanna from Salzburg. We lived a couple of doors down in a townhouse. You know, beautiful, outspoken, interpreting woman living by herself, kind of like my inner man. And I, you know, she was just never in your face greatest sense of personal boundaries and just really, I don't know if she was a little tired from work, she just really had it together as far as I can tell. I said to my mom, there's certain things, whether we've had drills or not, that I just, I don't worry about. They just seem really down to earth. And other people, sometimes other white women, whether we've had drills or not, they just seem insane. You know? I said to mom, you've had drills. She said, crazy. I do. And some women go crazy. Like they they don't notice it, and maybe none of us want to think that about ourselves, but I think some people actually do go a little insane. I don't think they realize it, but their mind is a little broken. These are some of the old people, old women that stare. I think there's something down there. I think there's something buried in there about economic climate and about sex and you know, some sort of cancer piece as well, but some fixation building the same part of the brain that has probably had to start working really hard to heal the blood at an early age. And as much as I could feel morbidly or alone or orphaned or upset, that person's brain, you know, could feel the same way on some level. Not to recommend any proximity or any kind of interaction in any way whatsoever, but I wouldn't want to do that. I'd say these things if I was very far from these types of people, but <clears throat> I work very carefully not to use people in the wrong way in my stories and my journey because I've had bad images of people. I don't wish to create a bad image of situation for a kind of even subtle slander. I'm not perfect, but I'm trying. Because, you know, people constitute a big part of my blog, what I edit, and what I put my food in. But this is what obviously what I find interesting in life, and since it's my YouTube channel, that's what I'm going to talk about. And uh, <coughs> it's not an area I'm very good at, probably. So, <coughs> which is probably another good reason for me to make these videos, because I can practice them. And what I do when I practice these things that are important to me uh, is spend time with myself. If I can really be clear about. My needs, my intentions, <clears throat> and separate them from those of other people who have a more fuzzy logic 
when it comes to interpersonal stuff. Put it that way. And it's more so as an adult, more so even just maybe even living in this area, than I've had to deal with, I think, ever. Although I've had it in other ways. I've lived in neighborhoods. I haven't lived in an apartment building. But I've lived in apartment buildings where people really keep to themselves. And it's gotten better, but uh, it's been a rough go. And, uh, <clears throat> Like I said, I think most people around us think of me somewhere between a homeless person and a degenerate and not much else besides. And the reason I'm comfortable with that, I guess, is because, you know, I shouldn't fault people for doing something that my own father does. And my aunt. A lot of white people, uh, even there's people in the building have good intentions that probably don't see me as a very distinct person. You know, um, and if you're not... If you don't, you know, wear the right things and talk the right way or have a gainful employment and don't seem very good at hiding that fact, uh, which in a way is to a white person as if I had weighed 600 pounds, like I'd let myself go, you know, to them. Look at you, look at you, happy, go lucky, deadbeat who doesn't work and has all day to walk or smoke or whatever you do, you know. How are they to think anything else in the way you talk and in white society and maybe others as well? You, you tell other people's brains how to think about you. It's, it's really an important thing. What you, I said to my mom, that my mom and my sister bought me, my brother gave me this, my sister sent me this watch, um, and so on. I, I wouldn't even look like this if people didn't help me um, because I'll wear whatever I have. I mean, I've never felt very good at giving people a, a, st a sterling impression, A, of myself, and why would I since... I've never, like a golf swing, ever hit upon a way of making an impression on someone that feels comfortable to me, you know, in any sense. So I don't really know how to be someone to other people, except polite. Uh, I sometimes when it seems to people like I'm overly polite or affect a certain manner, it's because my general interest is really just keeping peace and being respectful. And I'd rather just get in the tone of being respectful to someone right away. Like using someone's name right away, I want people to know, because I've met somewhat balanced white people, and I think just having a very passive, at the risk of being a little obsequious maybe, but agreeable um, attitude is the best way to deal with the most number of different kinds of people that I meet out here. So as a local animal, yeah, I don't try to mix it up with other people. I'm not they can be very passive aggressive at times and it's impossible almost not to be passive aggressive to someone being passive aggressive because almost anything you say and someone's being passive aggressive is going to sound passive aggressive i mean it's just you can think of countless examples maybe and white people can be very sarcastic if nothing else so you can say well you don't say or so you say it's probably sometimes the only safe thing they can do is like well well there's that then isn't there you know or like you can just acknowledge like well that's i guess you've said it all <laughs> so you know, I'm quite sure, uh, you, know, uh, you know, getting up and walking away at times would not be a wrong thing to do or to feel uncomfortable enough that maybe you shouldn't come back for a few days. So it can, it can have a very um, big impact. I don't want to let people know that it has an impact in as much as it can be very hard and cringeworthy to think that they don't know in some way or that they're not used to, in some cases, probably people who don't seem to react. That I seem a little too controlled, maybe. Uh, I'm not looking to give them that, but I think sometimes that actually, believe it or not, is telling as it may be. I don't want to you know, make people look bad, but like sometimes you get into a passive aggressive if you don't react to them. That can also kind of shock them. So, you know, and you could accuse me of, of doing that on purpose. Uh, controlling my speech and in certain ways or thanking them for the time they've taken to molest me without using the word molest. You know, just... Because I'm actually, I'm not trying to be false, I'm trying to actually see something good in them. I, I, feel, I, I really think that might, they might find reassuring because they're being so dehumanizing. I try to up the humanizing in them. And a lot of it is very effective when they first receive me. They say, okay, you know, all right, you're good. You know, you seem like a good person. Cool. Thank you for that. And just saying thank you. I've said thank you to women on the bus, just, you know, stalking and yelling at me, yelling at me, and just saying, and say, get out of my face, and just like thanking them. Going back to the bus, thank you so much. Why am I saying thank you? Well, thank you that there can be an end to this. 
and that I don't really have to have a say in any of this because that obviously would have the cost of a great deal of work and probably a lot more abuse. So, you know, it makes the economy very clear to me, just more clear than the American economy as to what role I play. It's very economic. And as long as such people get what they want, and you give them what they have the right to take from you and to accuse you of taking from them or whatever kind of psychological mugging or muggery that the white person happens to be about that day, the better. Because as pissy as that is, you're going to create an Olympic-sized pool of piss, and them and a hundred of their friends are going to go out swimming in it and getting soaked in it and thinking of ways to walk up to you and spit it in your face with a laser that goes into the center of your brain and makes your dick fall off. <coughs> You know, and that's how you're going to feel. And it's going to be like jellyfish going. Zzz, 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 zzz. And, you know, the likelihood that I have an experience with that really revolves around the fact that I've been around people, white people, too much. And I got to know more than one of them at a time. You know, in a way that brought us into local proximity with, you know, with them and their friends. And that's what happened. And I guess the flattering part of it, which is kind of sadomasochistic, like that Christian saying to be persecuted just shows that God knows you love him, um, is uh, maybe people find me important enough to, to sing the thing, but really not. They just find that other person's attention enough. And that person isn't your friend, obviously. And, but they don't know that. Because in their world, you can have unconditional love and still talk shit about something and become so insensibly enraged by something they've said to you or asked of you that their rage is translated into their ability to go numb and to invite other people to treat you in a way that they have to make no provision and to create a void, almost like a form of gaslighting around provisions they have to make about your self-respect, safety, or esteem. They really turn you into something human who is malignant enough in some way or by word of mouth to warrant dehumanizing behavior and humiliating behavior in public while this person takes an absolutely calm, totally detached view as to how and what way that might upset you the least. You deserve it physically as much as you deserve to feel everything you're going to then feel right down in your throat. It's a physical language down to words and white people are very good at it. It's not a crime, but white people can mug you with how they talk about you. It's got a very so there kind of attitude. And I've seen it enough. It's like it lives in me. I've seen it, I've watched it, I've witnessed it. And yeah, it's a training in itself not to do anything worse than just turning on your heel and saying, I've had enough of this and walk away. I mean it it, it, it it's words, but it's also like a level of poisoning and physical malignance that no amount of your own abhorrence is going to dehumanize. And since I'm not in the matter of punching people either, not that that would do anything, there's really nothing you can do but walk away. And know that on some level, that's the best way that someone could deal with whatever's up for them, is if they scare themselves. <laughs> You know, people have to scare themselves sometimes. Not always, like, you know, like other things may need to be done or something is wrong with me. But I think for from what I encounter a lot, or if they're drunk, people have to kind of deal with themselves over there. I, I'm not, I don't put myself in the position of curbing people's anger. Uh, that, I'm not that guy. And if I did, I would get punched in the face for sure. So I don't police people. I try to be very, very polite. So on my channel, when I talk about white people, I'm something I don't normally do, <laughs> yeah, but I'm talking about how I really feel, and uh, white people can be very passive-aggressive, and the only thing I think is if they one day they just startle themselves, which, you know, sometimes I, sometimes I think they might, other times it's amazing that they don't, because they do absolutely nothing, and that, you know, and that's the only thing, to give you some idea of what they win, that could possibly change anything about how their brains are working that is as if they suddenly thought wow that was a bit much and but away from me away from any god looking at them and judging them just to think huh maybe that wasn't so nice to that person that would be feel a little shame you know 
it's awkward. It's a coincidence. It's not a big deal. But to the to the white people I meet, I think they do these things to a lot of people, and they don't notice, and they're not drunk. It's fascinating. But as much as I grew up with a very insecure, narcissistic father, who was always on, and you could see like it covers up a host of sins, not just for him, but in the awkwardness of white people in general, that you just pump out a lot of energy. As long as you're not like openly insulting anyone, like and just like people pleasing, gregarious energy, you know, it white people really respond to that. A lot of male white psychopaths and females, they know that it just spray a lot of energy around. You know, just get everyone just starts spinning nicely and everyone relaxes. You know, or it's a good thing, or it just quiets the, all the awkwardness. But it eliminates it and it forms, you know, everything. So it puts it puts that person in a kind of defensive position. If my dad was doing that, at the same time he wasn't thinking about me. He was protecting me, but not thinking about me. He was engaging people, family, anyone really. And just saying whatever, doing whatever, and you were in the background. You know? He was the stereo. You were the cords in the back of the stereo. I think that's why I got interested in the cords in the back of the stereo. I just think I could relate to it. I wasn't the thing making any of the important sounds, just something in the background generating those sounds. It could be red or blue or yellow or white. See, we can put apparatus together and computers and monitors, but we can't do that with our minds and our voices. Well, there's a lot of things that people don't think. It's part of the reason for art and technology. Art and all of its collectivity can have a collection of profoundly deep and sympathetic human emotional forces. Positively. society takes up you know a good deal of the poundage of the of the deeper more soulful waters of human existence as a whole a certain part of all of us understands and a certain part of all of us or sometimes are included in a certain part of the, the art events, religious customs, maybe even the UFO and everything else would do the same. But the most important times of my year are the times of the year, like now. The holiest days of my year is when I can find the most time to just stay at home quietly and enjoy. To live a peaceful day is its own reward, you know, its own celebration. into the pot or a check into the collection plate. Maybe put a new credit card on my bar. I don't like bars, but people do be silly. I just think of nice things about it. You know, a glass of beer from a stained glass window. about well drawn beer, a bottle of beer, that liquid in there, the brown of that bottle, the copper, the amber, the smell. I suppose that is you know something sacred to it. Can you guarantee it many people's needs? 
because of aesthetic to it. You know, relaxing of the heart, the mouth, the body. Lay drawn into some new posture. Emotions will feel flow with what you do. You run the old pipes, old glass, but no one had to pick up the water pumps. No one needed our love or attention to step into the mystery. Let it all go. See, the thing about the ritual of drinking is what happens if you come home and the children there and they're still talking and the pipes are still blowing now something gets on your hands it disturbs your female euphoria that's where the problem starts with it I've been sitting too long one plus three Shadow of the cloud right now. People off the beach. Oh god, that sun feels good. Oh look at those flowers, they like it too. Oh, it feels good. Time, nature, and the sun. A kind of food. Oh, thank you so much. I really do need to gather these days as much as I can. Oh boy. Really soak them in. They're good for me. This is like a spa treatment for my spirit. It really is. I mean, have you ever found a little peace on the earth? <sighs> you know, and in that sigh or in that breath, how many people will understand all of your labors? You know, and you don't have to justify them, but also people don't exactly hear about all of them. And if they did, it would just be you justifying them getting their attention and justifying taking it away from all the things that are more important because sure enough there isn't enough attention for what everyone needs to talk about all the stuff that they're actually going through that's that's attention in all society you know that's why therapists should get training from hollywood screenwriters they seem to know a lot about psychopaths that psychiatrists don't seem to know what people go through on an ordinary, everyday level that even fictional characters have trouble dealing with it. So it's like, you know, it's a like the phantom character in the Western religion and English and Shakespearean canon is, par you know, parental or paternal surrogacy and uh, a lot of the more pathological proportions of that. And that would be my thought on that. Now I'm going to go and call my mother. Mom! 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 Where are you? Mom? Whoop! Mom, where'd you go? Mom! Mama! 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 Mama!